I'm Aaron Lazar. I am stepping in to Demon Live event this evening, Blue Devils on Broadway. I'm stepping in to moderate because uh, our moderator for the evening, Nathaniel Hill of Broadway Plus, Duke grad and uh, great guy. He actually had to hop on a plane and get to San Francisco for the Hamilton tour. And so I am here. Uh, I am here cold, cold reading this evening's program. So thank you for being a very kind audience this evening. Um, for those of you who have no idea who I am, I graduated from Duke in 98. Uh, I was a music major, A.J. Fletcher scholar who ended up um, taking all the pre-med stuff and thinking I was going to medical school and ended up becoming an actor. So uh, I'm an actor, singer. I've been uh, in a bunch of Broadway shows, most recently toured with Dear Evan Hansen, which came through Durham. So I don't know if you guys saw me at DPAC, if you're local to the Duke area, uh, or maybe caught me on a TV show called Filthy Rich on Fox during the pandemic with Kim Cattrall. But I'm thrilled to be here tonight um, to speak with our two fantastic panelists. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank this episode's co-sponsors. That would be Duke New York, Demon New York, and Broadway Plus. Uh, for everyone, please note that we are recording this Zoom so we can stream it later on Demon Live. And uh, tonight's panelists join us to welcome back Broadway, and I'm very excited to, uh, to speak to them and to introduce them to all of you. And um, make sure, if you have questions, please post them in what? In, in the chat, I guess. And we have uh, some incredible folks who are going to collect those questions. And at the end of the program, we will do like a Q and A um, so that we can try and hear from you guys directly. Uh, okay. So it is my pleasure to introduce our two panelists this evening. Um, their full bios, should you want to learn more about them, are up on Demon Live's episode page. So I'm just going to do quick introductions here, and then you're going to learn so much about them as we speak. Our first panelist is Mr. Charles Randolph Wright. He is Duke's class of 1978. Charles is a writer, director, and producer of theater, television, and film, a native of York, South Carolina. He was an AB Duke scholar and received Duke's Distinguished Alumni Award. And Charles, you are directing Trouble in Mind by Alice Childress on Broadway. And you open so soon, man, at the Roundabout Theater on October 29th. It is very exciting. To have you here, please say hi to Charles, everyone. And Charles, I've heard about you since uh, my days at Duke, and I've always wanted to meet you. And we've almost sort of crossed paths here recently, so I'm thrilled to get to meet you and talk to you tonight. Um, great, great, and thanks. Of course, of course. And uh, everyone, let's meet our other panelists for the evening. Ms. Donya Tamar, she is Duke's class of 2010 and is a director, writer, and translator and an Obie award-winning director at that, making her Broadway debut with Antoinette Chinonier Wandu's play, Passover, which premiered on August 4th at the August Wilson Theater. Hi, Donya, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. You're welcome, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. So, uh, Charles and Donya, thank you both for being here. It is a crazy, crazy time. And um, I moved from New York to Los Angeles about six years ago. And so my heart has been out to everyone who has been going through the pandemic uh, in New York, let alone uh, in the theater. What, uh, we're wondering what, what this has been like for you. Um, and so, you know, we're excited to hear about that. And before we sort of jump in, um, can you tell us how you became involved in these two productions? Like what the process was like uh, sort of through development and how you ended up bringing them to Broadway? Danya, I'll let you go first. Have okay. That. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Um, so the My Path with the Passover is, um, really unique. I mean, as all as all paths in the theater are. So I had met the playwright Antoinette in 2016 or 
2016 or 2015 when I first read the play and it was being done at a very small theater in New York called Cherry Lane Mentor Project. And I interviewed to direct the play then and I did not get the job. And I returned to that moment because you never know what anything is gonna happen. So Antoinette and I connected. It was at a time in my career where I hadn't made that much work. She was looking for somebody who had experience to mount this play. It wasn't me, but we connected. So. She and I started working on other shows of hers. The play was supposed to then go to Steppenwolf, where it was meant to be directed by a great director named Liesl Tommy. Liesl Tommy got her first episode of television about four weeks before Passover was supposed to start rehearsals. So she had to drop out of the production. And when she did that, Antoinette called me and said, I know this is crazy, but would you direct this play? And it was like the sky opening up. I mean, she and I had been working on a different play of hers for the year before this happened. Um, and so I jumped into this play about a month before we started. Before working at Steppenwolf, the biggest theater I've been in was probably like 70 seats. And there, there started this beautiful um, collaboration. So she and I worked on the play together in Chicago at Steppenwolf. Um, Evan Kavnitz came from New York. He's the artistic director of LCT3, the small theater there. He saw the play. He brought it to Lincoln Center. Antoinette and I, while we were doing it there in the 100 seat theater, kept telling them, you should really put this play on Broadway. And they're like, ha ha ha, nice idea. But uh, Matt Ross, who is our lead producer, did see the show and approached Antoinette in like January or February before the pandemic and said, I love this play. I'm just starting to produce now. He had done one show. I want to bring this play to Broadway. And then the shutdown happened. So that happened right before Antoinette sat with it. Um, she's done some really amazing interviews where she talks about what it meant to bring this play for her to Broadway, how she wanted to rewrite it um, and think about it uh, for this particular moment. So it's like a, a, a journey that started out with me not getting the job. And now we are working together on this play and it is now on Broadway. So that's the weird and blessed journey of Passover. I feel like this play has always been, has had its own heart, soul, engine, motor. And if you can just listen to what it wants, it will, you can go with it. But Passover is huge on its own as a piece of writing. Wow. Tanya, that is Thank so you. true. That's so, you know, the idea of you never know where something happens. I actually read Trouble in Mind when I was at Duke. So I literally have decades of, of this with this play. I read this, we were looking for something, we were doing several scenes and I was looking for something written by a black writer that we were doing in what was then called Branson, which is now the Brody Theater. And we were, I was trying to find a piece that spoke to theater. And I don't know how, where I found this, it was in a group, in a book of plays. And I was astounded by this writing. Alice Childress wrote this play in 1955. Alice was from South Carolina, as is my family. People knew our families in a way were connected, knew of each other, because you do. And so the I, I've always been obsessed with her writing and this play. And years passed, my play Blue is at the roundabout. Roundabout is known for taking classic plays and bringing them to, you know, back to Broadway. And so I started my quest to make this play, which was not a classic play in the sense of Broadway because it never got to Broadway and I wanted it to happen. And it's taken me 15 years to make this play come to life. And it's also appropriate because when Alice wrote this, it was a huge hit off Broadway. They wanted to move it to Broadway. That was 1957. The producer said, we will move it if you rewrite it, if you change it. There's too much in this that's hard hitting. You can't say this about the business. You can't say this about us because it's about putting on a play on Broadway. And Alice at that time really called out people to task. And to her credit, she said no. And she never, the play never received its due on Broadway. Another play ended up going instead, which was this play that you may have heard of called A Raisin in the Sun. So. Alice never had her due. A Raisin in the Sun happened, became the tremendous hit that it is, that it still is. And so my, I've just been obsessed with making this happen and, and just pushed. And Todd Haynes, who runs the roundabout, we did several readings over the years. And 
to have it happen now is astounding because of where we are. And I described the pandemic, and I know we're talking about that as two pandemics, because there's a health pandemic and a race pandemic. And this play deals with that in a way that will astound audiences because you think it was written in 2021, not in 1955. Well, thank you both. Um, a, a, a question for, uh, for both of you, you know, we know how hard it is to open a play on Broadway in normal times. Have there been challenges to getting your plays open? I know Charles, yours hasn't opened yet, but it's on the, on the cusp. Um, what have, have, have been maybe some of the most interesting or challenging uh, obstacles that you guys have come up against in, in doing so? So I, I went through rehearsals in July, which in some ways was different than now because Delta wasn't raging as it is. Mm -hmm. But I think that what Charles is saying about the duality of the pandemic has also been in the rehearsal room as well. There are things, and I, I don't know if this is your experience or what it's like with Roundabout, but this is the first time where Antoinette and myself have been able to advocate for things like a mental health stipend. Like think about what these actors are portraying. Think about what ghosts and what ancestors are you bringing into the room as you wanna tell these stories? What is the cost of that on the actor? What is that cost of that on designers? People who are with this material day in and day out, repetition of it. And so, Things that have been different for me, this, these are first is that the actors have a mental health stipend and they don't get asked what they want to spend it on. They can use it as they want to, $250 a week. Um, we have an equity, diversion, inclusion person in the room and that person has been invaluable in ways that I could never have imagined um, utilizing that collaborator in the room. So things like that, the resources that this production had this time around were beyond what I've experienced um, when trying to advocate for such things before the pandemic. And then in terms of, of COVID, um, it just heightens the need to trust, to build trust in the room across so many different levels. Do, are we all have to buy in on the testing? You know, when you go away from the rehearsal room, what you do actually matters. So understanding like, okay, so don't go to a bar in a basement. That doesn't mean you can't see people or see friends or do things but there's a mindfulness on what you're doing outside the room that is on a different level to anything I'd experienced before, trying to keep the production safe, um, trying to keep all the actors healthy so that they can go on, so that they can do their jobs. So that has been fascinating. You know, we tested, depending on how thick COVID is in New York, we test anywhere from three times a week to five times a week. Um, so it is a wild time to be making work. I'm so grateful and there's nowhere I would rather be than in a theatrical rehearsal room on, with a play like Passover or a play like Trouble in Mind that is going to change people who see it. That's been my experience sitting with the audience. The quality of the audience post, post everything is different. There's an appreciation for the form. There's an appreciation to see what actors can do in a room together. And so those are some of the things that I've, I mean, I still feel in it because we haven't closed. I'm still in it, but that's, it's been challenging, but it's been a gift. Um, and it's a gift to be among the first um, to come back, to try to say, no, let's, let's try to really do some of these things that people were talking about this last year and a half. And bravo to you, Danya, to being first, because all of us are following in your footsteps going, oh, I mean, I've been working in television, fortunately, for the past year, as like as you did, Aaron, and that's a whole other realm, but it's still in close, you're still in your bubble, the, uh, the audience doesn't come in. Right. And the first show, I went to see Bruce Springsteen when, when that opened, and my friend was the lighting designer, and she said, I walked into the theater and I looked traumatized. <laughs> and, I, and I was, I was thinking, oh my God, how do we do this? What do we do? What is this? And just that energy, because theater is unlike seeing television, unlike watching a film, it's, it's together, you're together, it's tactile, it's, it's volatile, it's all those things. And so in a way you feel like you have to take those away. And so I don't know what my rehearsal process will be, but you know, we're following all the protocols and all of this and just wearing a mask alone is so difficult to communicate and having to do that. But I know how imperative it is that we as artists do our work because we art heals 
And this is the time when on every level, especially in this country, especially right now, we need the healing that I know your piece has been giving so many people, you know, and what I hope that we also do. And um, so that journey of how to do it is, you know, I'm still, I, I, in a way I was, I want to pass over and get to your side of it, you know, but it's, uh, it's thrilling because every type, every time you do any kind of work, how you approach it, we just have to approach it differently, you know, but we have those tools because we've done all kinds of work. So you just have to look at, this is the world now, and it will never revert to what it was, which is a great thing. And so whatever that means, what does the future mean? I don't know. But we, in this moment, will tell stories that, that I don't know if Passover would have gotten a Broadway. I don't know if Trouble in Mind, we were slated to happen actually a couple years ago. So it's not the knee jerk reaction of, oh, let's put this play up now, because it does concern me. There's seven plays by black playwrights on Broadway, right? That will happen this fall. And in the spring, there will be none. So that, you know, I, I have to deal with that energy of what that means. I have to, as I often say, it's hard to be grateful and bitter at the same time. So I'm trying to juggle how grateful I am for all of these artists that you get to make your debut, that all these things happen, but you wish there were, it was under circumstances where we, we are equal where there is the equality of the work. And that's the thing that's been challenging as well. But through this pandemic, we all fight through all those things, which we always fight for. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's such, it's just, it's just such an unprecedented time. And um, uh, Donya, kudos to your producers because the mental health thing is for real. And, uh, and uh, I've heard mixed sort of things about how producers are handling uh, the pandemic and protocols and to hear that there's a mental health stipend is a wonderful thing. And it sounds like your producers are wonderful producers. So that's encouraging. And um, yeah, you know, Charles, let's hope that there's an elevation of consciousness here that stays. Yeah. And and just to add to what Charles is saying, what's tricky and and we just have to continue to fight is that not these plays should all be on Broadway. They are all of a quality that deserves to be on Broadway. And yet they're also having to all weather the transitional point of people's fear about entering public space together. And so that is real. And that now is on the burden of these plays in a way that plays always have a burden that musicals don't. So I think it is important for the collective theater family to keep this front of front of conversation, um, especially as we look to spring um, and then years beyond of what is actually uh, on Broadway, what kind of work makes other work in relief. It's like the to actually have a myriad of voices on Broadway will only elevate Broadway forever. Tony, what was opening like? What was opening night like for you? We we had a few because our first preview, I think, was really like a wild, out of body experience. Um, as Charles knows, like director of first preview, it's like the most, or at least for me, it's the most stressful time. You're like, wow, everybody's seeing all this. It's not ready. Oh, I'm in the thick of it. But it was also a hugely celebratory night because people were back in space together. Um, Antoinette, the playwright, gave this incredible speech like on the balcony of the August Wilson Theater. And she was raised in the church and she knows how to give a sermon and she did. And so to hear her speak about the moment, about the play, what it means for her as an artist, as a woman, um, and also just what it means for our form to be back was amazing. I think I was like out of my body a little bit because I was um, just working on the play and she was rewriting the play through our previews, which was thrilling and, you know, nerve wracking and in the, in the best way. So I think that that's an experience that I will be able to reflect on when more time passes. Um, and we finally were able to have our opening with friends and family and celebrate and that felt good. That felt so good. There's so many Broadway debuts on this show, not just on stage with the actors. 
Our stage managers, two of the three are making their debuts. They've all gotten to call the show as PSMs our wardrobe supervisor. So like that, that part of it feels so good to be in the August Wilson theater, which is a gorgeous theater and see this play there and see it fit so well in a space like that to see it size up beautifully. That all gave me faith. It all felt wonderful. Um, so it was a great, great, great experience. And like I was saying, I think audiences are in a different place with how they're able to appreciate live performance. Um, I think that's new. I hope that sticks. It's different than screens, not to diminish television. Television is a wonderful art form, but there is something different about breathing air with the people on stage. Uh, Charles, piggybacking off of that, you work in all of the different media. Can you talk a little bit about the differences for you in creating and developing in theater versus TV and film? I mean, theater has always been my first love. It will always probably remain that. What disappoints me about theater is the lack of equity in voices, in, in people of color, in women. You know, three white men run Broadway and they control what happens on Broadway. And, and as long as that happens, there is going to be a certain view always of what comes in, unfortunately. What we hope is that that changes. Whereas in television right now, I feel that there's this renaissance for people of color in television. There's so many, there's so many outlets and so many things. So I've really been enjoying all the different voices and to walk into a room and see so many people who look like me in that same room is unusual because I've spent most of my career being solitary, you know, mm -hmm. being one of the few. And, and to be able to see that shift, especially in television, in film, and my hope is that it happens in the theater, that we finally have this way. I mean, there've always been performers of color, there've always been, but I think there are only 15 directors in history of color on Broadway. Um, it's now, you know, 16, 17, you know, there, but there have been so few. I, I've hired a lighting designer for my production who actually taught at a, a, at a university in Chapel Hill, we won't name, but um, she, <laughs> she was there at, 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 and at Carolina for years. I mean, an extraordinary lighting designer, a woman of color who has worked in the business for four decades and never could get that Broadway shot. And she has been, there've only been two lighting designers of color in history on Broadway. And so you have all those things. And when you talk about mental health, Danya, it's even to the extent of just walking in a room and seeing someone who looks like you, mm -hmm. walking into a place and feeling comfortable. I think our job as directors is to make, we have to make people comfortable to tell stories, to tell fun stories that are fun, to tell a very difficult story the way you did, and brava for that mental health pushing, because I know you pushed for that, but for making that happen, because it's hard to do a play that way every night and then let that go. How do you walk out into, into the world after that? And so it, it's, it's very important that we find the ways in each medium to be more representative and not just in a token way that we are just open up to all stories and that all people go to all stories, that it's not just because we've become so specific about theater, it's black theater and women's theater and gay theater and all these. It's like, I wanna see every type of thing. I, I wanna find the thing in another story that speaks to me. I want to, I, and as more as specific as it is, makes it universal. So I think that's what I hope that theater will open its doors more than they have, because it's been a journey for me for decades. And I've been very fortunate because of my work, but it's been so difficult. And it's thrilled to now see Danya and other artists kick those doors down that we fought to open. And that makes me so happy and even happier that it's Duke. So, you know, I want the doors kicked by us first. Then, then we'll open the other ones. How's that? <laughs> Sounds good to me. Uh, you guys, to pivot for a second, you know, to have a 
healthy, successful career in entertainment, you have to be not only creative, but entrepreneurial, I find, innovative. Um, and that's clearly something that you've both done throughout your careers. Can you uh, maybe give some advice to students or alumni who are spearheading their own creative projects uh, and developing their own projects? Sort of what has maybe uh, inspired you or tools that, that you find have worked for you in your journey? Charles, do you want to go first? No, it's yours. <laughs> okay, well, let I don't me say, know. though, let me say about you okay. is um, look at Danya, the inspiration that she just shared earlier of there is this job. She did not get that job. And now she's directing the same play that she did not get. She directed that play on Broadway. That is the ultimate <laughs> journey. That is the ultimate thing. And I think the thing that Duke taught me, and then you can go, was maneuverability and how to deal with difficult situations, situations that may not be what I wanted them to be. And years later, now I've discovered how that helped me. So, Badania, your story is an inspiration in itself. Thank you, Charles. Um, I think something I've been thinking about a lot in terms of this question, and it might not be like a a sexy answer to the question, but when we were going to move Passover, I've worked with one actor in Chicago and that actor has gone through every single iteration of this. I tried to bring the whole cast from Chicago for reasons that are just so bureaucratic, they wouldn't let me. So we have a cast that came in New York, but what I'll say is when we were trying to put this play up now, there was a question about whether he would be able to do it because he had a television show. And I, we, the good news is he's in the play, John Michael Hill, he's brilliant, he's amazing, he is the heart of the play. But he said something to me that I cannot stop thinking about, which is, if I can't do this, I hope you find somebody you trust. He didn't say, I hope you find somebody talented, I hope somebody famous, somebody will sell tickets. He said, I hope you find somebody you'll trust. And I just keep coming back to that as the most important ingredient in in what we do, um, because this business is so um, can be so um, cruel and so much about money and about forward movement. I think that surrounding yourself with people that you trust and who you trust and who you've earned their trust is the way to forward yourself. I think that those relationships will pay off. You don't know how, you don't know when, but you, you are planting seeds through building trust with artists that you admire that you will see, like Charles was saying, maybe 20 years down the road, something will come and it will be beautiful because it will surprise you. So I think that releasing some kind of control, which is hard, I'm a director, I love control. I'm, you know, that's been the thing I think that keeps me calm at night is to, is trust, trust the universe, trust the journey, trust that, yeah, you had a great connection with Antoinette. You didn't get this job. That's okay. She's a great writer. She's somebody I want to know no matter what, if I'm doing her plays or if I'm just watching her plays. So that's been a touchstone for me and was pointed out to me again by John Hill in that moment of, in a scary moment of the play's life. Like, I don't want to do this with somebody else. Okay, if I have to, what's important? Um, so that's that's been the thing I've been thinking about a lot these past few months in terms of what is a career? How do you have a healthy career over time and maneuver through those ups and downs and stressful things? Wow. Um, Charles, do you mind if I hop in for a second? Please hop in. I was just going to say, uh, so I think, first of all, Johnny, what a fantastic answer, not just for our art and this industry, but this life, like relationships, you, you trust and letting go of control um, seem to be a big part of the lessons that I learned just about life. And to bring that to creativity is very powerful, very cool. And just a similar story to yours, when I was, my big sort of break on Broadway was The Light in the Piazza. And I had understudied in a couple of shows up till then and just never knew if I was going to break through. And I auditioned for the production originally. It, it, I think its route was Chicago, Seattle, Lincoln Center. And so I auditioned in Chicago for the Chicago 
uh, sort of developmental out of town. And I was told by the creative team that I was too old. And then I had a chance to audition for it however many years later on Broadway and I got the job. And it, it was impossible because I was too old two, three years ago, but I had just learned a lot about myself. I learned about what I could bring as an actor and, and the timing ended up being right. So you just, you, you really don't, you never know. And you have to let go of that kind of control because you just never know. And I'm sure we all here tonight have stories like that in any of our industries. Um, Charles, what about you? Any, um, anything you wanted to add? I think when she was saying that trust is imperative. And for me, I always describe it as having your tribe who are the people that will tell you, as you said, the truth, who are the people that stick with you no matter what. Um, many I met at Duke decades ago, actually. Um, my associate, I have a company with a, um, a young man who's now older, who also Martin Wilkins, who went to Duke 20 years after me, and we're partners in a company now. Um, I think they're the relationships, because we share this Duke experience, there's something to that of who we are as artists because we became artists despite going in because I also was pre-med. I, I don't know, Danya, you, I'm sure you were pre-med or pre-law probably, but <laughs> you know, I mean, we go in. So I said, I always talk about the most difficult thing I ever did was decide to go to New York and not go to med school. After that, everything seemed simpler and I always knew I could go back to school. It was imperative to me to try the thing that scared me the most, that seemed the furthest out of reach. And I always say to people, it doesn't matter whether you're just getting out of Duke or you graduated in the dark ages when I did, that you still must pursue that dream, that you're, the dreams don't die because you become older. Dreams aren't, I'm from a small town in South Carolina. It's so unlikely that I have the career that I have. And I was very fortunate for people who supported me, people who pushed me. We all have those professors who, who did that. We have family or we have friends, but whoever those people are, surround yourself with that tribe because that's how you continue to do the work. That's how 15 years of trying to make this play happen, I had people saying to me, you, you have to do that play. And I, would, I didn't give up. I wanted to give up, but I just kept doing that because it, it was so in me. And now here we are about to do that. So I think, and that brings me actually to the whole idea of Duke. You know, I, I was so jealous when I got to New York because of all the mafias, the Yale mafia, the Carnegie Mellon mafia, the, you know, the Juilliard mafia. And, you know, my mafia were all doctors and lawyers. So I, I, I thought, I mean, I could get anything I needed legally or medically, but when it came to, to this, I was like, how do we, how do we create, create and help each other? I was saying to Danya, we just met. I should have met her before, you know? And that's, um, I want to find ways, and there are different people, Martavius, I see you're on this. There are different people that I've met along the way that, you know, I just sit, I try to support and just say, you know, this is, this is my journey, your, diff your journey, will be different, but I will hear you. I will listen. I don't know what it is I can do. I might be able to hire you or not, but just that idea of our shared experience of what we went through in that tobacco city in North Carolina, that, that's something that I think is very valuable that we, and I like what's happening with the work that their people at Duke are doing now to connect us all, something like this. I mean, I had nothing like this when I left, I didn't know anyone in the business. We, there were three of us who just did it. So I think it's, it's um, I'm, I'm proud that I can come back and be a part of this and that we can all share our different experiences. And then hopefully we'll find ways that we all work together, that we help each other, that we create together, that we become part of a bigger tribe than just the, the, the small tribe that I have. Mm. I think it's, uh, I, I, I agree, it's a wonderful thing. I think Duke also taught me that, pers that perseverance, that drive, because you're competing with the best of the best at Duke. 
Um, and I remember, I remember thinking uh, my first, first of all, shout, shout out to some Duke teachers who helped me realize that I was going to head the path of being an artist instead of being a doctor because uh, I was majoring in music. I was helping to start an opera program and didn't know much about opera and wanted to try and create a musical theater focus and couldn't do it. Um, and Jeff Storer and Jody McAuliffe saw me in a voice recital and Jeff cast me in, as Billy Bigelow in Carousel. And I had said, oh, I don't, I'm not at Duke to do shows. I got to pre-med it up and make sure that I get all these great grades and I get into a great medical school. And I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to be a part of that production. And, and that sort of started this snowball. And, and then Jody would cast me plays and Jeff and Jody were like, look, you should do this for a living. And I was like, oh, you're crazy. Like I had no, no one in my family does this. Um, and it took that support and encouragement. And Manny Eisenberg was teaching a, a, a play appreciation class at Duke and he's become a mentor and a friend. And so if I didn't have that support from Duke, I'd be a doctor and have a whole different life and <laughs> not have pursued this thing that I knew I needed to, to pursue. So I'm grateful to, to Duke as it sounds like you guys are. And the only thing I was going to bounce back to is sort of this developmental. And I have to issue. jump in. I have to jump in on this. I saw yeah. you do carousel. John no, Clum, did. John yeah. Clum, who is my big John, person. Yes, John, yeah. John Clum said, you have to see this young actor. You have to see this. And I'm, I'm from Carolina anyway, so I literally went through Duke on my way to visit my family to see who this, this, this upstart was at Duke, <laughs> who everyone was talking about. So I actually saw you do that. Wonderful. Charles, I'm I as you're saying that, I am remembering that is that I'm I'm it's crazy that I'm just remembering this now. So that is the first time I heard your name because I think you were kind enough to either write me a note on a business card or something and have John give it to me or something. And I was like, wait, there are people from Duke who are like successful in the entertainment <laughs> industry, like, oh my God. Um and it's crazy to me that, you know. 20 years. I don't know how long it's been, but now I finally get to meet right. you. By the way, you look younger than me. So whatever you're doing, man, thumbs it's, up. It's, a, it's it. black. Don't crack. It's, 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 you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's family. What can I do? Plus I do um, COVID hair crazy. too. You know, it's that. <laughs> I wanted to, before we jump to like uh, a Q and A and, and take some of our audience questions, can we, um, there's so many more questions after you guys, but this is sort of the, the one that's coming to mind, the developmental process of, of shows, be it in theater or television or film, I feel like I had no idea what that was until I started to try and produce. And so I, I'm hoping maybe you guys can talk a little bit more about what it's like. I think people see a television show or a Broadway play and think, okay, uh, an actor, you know, a writer puts it together and came to get like, in trying to produce TV, for example, like I know it's, six years on one of these projects. And Charles, you're talking about 15 years on uh, your play, Trouble of Mind. And Donnie, you're talking about how Passover got to where it's at. Um, anything more you guys want to say just about how art is made? It, it's about and, when uh, she was saying about the truth and that journey, I think the other thing that obviously relationships are imperative because it's, you may have the greatest project there is, but if you, how is it seen? How do you communicate? How does someone get to see what that is? And so it's your belief in the work and finding the different ways in which you can get something out there, that you can have it communicated, that you can make it present, make your work present and prescient. I think both things are, are the pieces of it. And it's, it's the belief in that, in the, it's the belief in that journey. And just as you just kept saying the truth of that, and then using the, the Duke tools of how to work 
of how you do things. Because people say, how do you do all these projects at once? And I said, well, I had six papers due at once. You know, <laughs> I, I got them done. And I actually didn't do well when I only had one due. When I had several that I had to have been, when I was juggling all of that, it made me focus differently. It made me get that work done. So I apply that now, years later, I understand that. I didn't then. But now I understand that there are so many things, my discipline, I really received there. And how to make it work for me. That was the thing that was the most important thing that I knew my path would be different from anyone else's path. So, but how to use what I knew, what I was taught and what I also rebelled against. Mm. I love that last part too. <laughs> yes. Um, something I, I don't know if this is a, a direct answer to that question because it's a great question. And I, I'm still trying to figure out some of that. In theater, things... I, I do think Charles is right. The people who really are in control, that has to change. Then work can change and what work gets accepted, what work gets the gaze, what work gets uh, resourced will also change. Um, but something that I really value from my time at Duke was working with and for non-theater people. Many of the people in the plays that I was directing at Duke are not doing theater now. Um, some of the best, the best actor I worked at, with at Duke, Vinnie Ray, who played for the Bengals. Like he was an incredible actor and incredible athlete. So I think that there is something about both in terms of how can you work with lots of different kinds of people as actors that really, as I think about Duke was amazing because you just meet people on a human level. And then also the work you're making at Duke is not the same as if you're at a place like Yale where it's like, oh yes, it's all theater and it's, it's so competitive. It's like, oh, we're gonna go support our friend in this play, I guess, they're in a play. And so you start to make work for a more general public, which I think is mm. important. I think something that, that makes me sad about the reputation theater has is that it's somehow like erudite or for the elite, or you need a pass or you need some kind of education when as children, we have all done theater in our imaginations when we play in the backyard, when we, you know, at night before going to bed. So that really, as I reflect on my time at Duke, the ability to make theater just for, for whoever was around, whoever was in the play and their friends, I think has stuck with me to keep it grounded. That's not to say that you can't make like avant-garde cool stuff, but make it for the people. And with an understanding that this is, this art form is really for everybody. It's a basic, it's a basic human right. And it makes people happier when they can engage this way, um, when they can imagine and be playful and be in community settings with, with people that they know telling stories. So I felt that at Duke, and I don't know if I would have felt that at a Yale or, or any other place where there was a conservatory and a way of doing things in a hyper-competitive, um, you know, Duke was hyper-competitive in other ways, for sure. Uh, that's not to say that wasn't there, but the theater felt I don't know, like what it's not the focus of Duke or it wasn't when I was there. So it, it had a different feeling. You had a another it's challenge. Perfect. You know, you had, to, you had a different, you had another challenge to just get P at, you know, at Yale, of course, you're going to go see someone's play. I mean, uh, you know, at, at Carnegie, at where, at Juilliard, that's what that is. But if you could capture a Duke audience and actually get them in, imagine, right? So I think that was also part of, of, helping us to understand also the world. What I'm very, very grateful for is that I went to a place where I got to experience far more than just the myopic view of a conservatory. And, and I think that you must know everything as an artist, as a person of the world. You must know everything, be exposed to everything. And that, that's what we were, were given. I didn't know that then, but that's what we were given. I cut you off, Aaron. No, not at all. I was just going to say it's, it's, it's to me, it speaks to courage, you know, the courage to, to you just have to try. And uh, the, the, sorry, if you hear my children in the background now, um, there's, there's a mindset, at least I remember of going to Duke, of, you know, having these intense blinders on, like I'm, I'm pursuing this myopic goal. And it's so important because I'm competing with all the best of the best. And so I have to and then once you have the courage to start to sort of break that apart a little bit and start to explore different things, and I think it's important, especially with a career in the arts, because you just have no idea. You think 
I'm going to be an actor. You might write, you might direct, you might produce, you might this. And now it's not the sort of, you know, I, I feel like when I was a Duke, there was this, you, you, you don't want to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. You really want to focus on a thing. And I think now the, the climate is much more supportive of the multi hyphenate, you know, titles and jobs. And I think that's an awesome thing because, creativity is creativity and you have no idea how ideas are going to come to you and through you and what. So exploring that for any of the students out there listening or, you know, uh, that have the courage to just go for it. Um, Charles and Donnie, thank you very much. You guys are awesome. And it's been awesome talking to you. And we have a couple more minutes left to try and take some questions from our audience. And, uh, Let's see, here's a question. How does the art form of the play evolve as we reemerge different due to the pandemic? Are there ways to bring the audience into the play in a way that allows for a deeper connection and conversation? Great question. <laughs> I mean- Go for it. There are things that I think that we, I would love the theater to be doing that they're not, still not doing yet, that would ease this transition, both for audiences and artists. I think the truth is it was amazing. Um, it was amazing to rehearse this play and bring it to Broadway. It was incredible anxiety, even at best case scenario. I think for audiences, as they come in, it's high anxiety, even though you know everybody's vaccinated, even though you know everybody's wearing a mask. And so I do think there's still space for more care across the board. Um, you know, right now we can't do talkbacks, they say, because of COVID, but, you know, Passover and Trouble in Mind are place people need to talk about. They really need an outlet and they need people who are qualified to lead those discussions. Mm -hmm. This has been an issue with Passover since Chicago, where like we did not have the resources and the staff and the, or, or they were not found to hold these kinds of discussions for a play like this, but people need to have them. So it's a great question. I think that there's still more to do. There's still more to do to make the experience as fulfilling and as healing as it really could be. I think doing these plays is a start, but it's only the tip of the iceberg in terms of like care for everyone involved. Um, so it's a great question. I that's that's kind of where I am at with it now. I agree. How do we how do we communicate? How do we have conversations um, about difficult things and also joyous things? I think it's necessary to have joy in the midst of all this darkness. It's imperative that we find joy. And so how and you can find that in all kinds of ways. So I, but the communicating is is imperative and i mean we've done this when we're all so sick of zoom and we've been doing it um you know i say i'm sick of zoom and sick of cooking both of those but where it's how do we now talk to each other um because it's not going to be the same as it was we have to we, we have a different way we have a different things that we didn't deal with before so i i do think that as you were saying theater can do that and and it's unfortunate that the talkbacks can't happen in person, but hopefully they will somehow happen. Yeah, I was just gonna say if there's a way, uh, I'm happy to be a part of some kind of team spearheading like virtual talkbacks after performances mm. um, and moderating those and trying to engage audiences in those. I think I've only performed on stage limited during COVID, but my experience was uh, similar to what you speak about, guys, which is that audiences are so grateful to be back in a live environment and so appreciative of the work in ways that perhaps was taken for granted a little bit prior to the pandemic. And so we do have an opportunity right now to talk about the work in ways that, you know, having been an actor who's you know, come out on that stage many nights after a performance and seen this a limited school group of, you know, 20 or 30 people or this amount of people who were able to pay X amount of dollars to Broadway Cares in order to be able to talk about the work. 
I wonder now if there is some kind of, it would be interesting to see if there was an increased uh, desire from audiences to engage and discuss this stuff because it's not like we're all just leaving the theater and hopping out to a restaurant to do whatever or what we used to do it's there's there is an opportunity here to sort of talk about the work in ways that might be we might not have for ever you know um so if any entrepreneurial do folks want to join me in the virtual talk back business let's figure it out this is a definite i don't know who, who knows margaret scogland this is a definite yeah. Margaret Scogland world that we need to make her do this. So <laughs> Margaret, you have to have to deal with this. But I, I, I love that idea because I do want that communication. I mean, just even just being with the two of you and having everyone else, it's just, oh, that's right. I'm not doing this by myself, you know, because it's so solitary um, working the way we've been working. So even this tonight has been, um, just it, it's so great to go, OK, you've done this already. Let me I can do it. You know, you, you're giving me that inspiration to go make that happen. And then, Aaron, when you do your next project, you know what what that is and us being able to share that with each other, I think, is really important. So we, we've had our own little baby talk back. Yeah. We have. Speaking of next project, you uh, do you guys want to talk about what you've got? Coming up, I will go first because it won't be nearly as interesting as you guys. Um, during the pandemic, I, I produced an album called Broadway Lullabies because I was singing my kids to sleep with these songs. And I we had some panic attacks going on due to COVID and we had anxiety issues. And um, singing them to sleep was what we would do. And then I thought, I think a lot of parents and kids and not just the kids but the adults could use some soothing music so i called up a bunch of broadway star friends and uh the producer of the music for the show i was on at the time filthy rich on fox and uh our music director for the dear evan hansen tour and we produced this album virtually and it's all uh parents who sing their broadway star parents singing their favorite broadway songs as lullabies we reorchestrated and reimagined the songs of lullabies so you can go to broadway-lullabies.com or you can find it on streaming and i actually my kids asked for it since the delta thing is happened. they've been asking for it every night so i hadn't listened to it in a while until recently and i'm i listened to it myself last night to go to sleep because i was just stressed out so it's just a relaxing thing um and other than that i'm just developing some some TV projects and auditioning. What about you, Charles and Sonia? Um, the play that I was doing when the pandemic hit is a play by Jeremy O'Harris called Daddy that is takes place near a swimming pool and has involves nudity and like the most intimate things I've ever staged. So that's what we were doing when COVID hit. And that is what we'll resume doing um, at some point uh, in the springtime. And then a project that I got from something I made on Zoom, I did a Zoom production of a play I had done in real life and somebody saw it um, in this theater in Ireland. And so I'm gonna direct for the first time a non-living playwright, uh, Samuel Beckett's Endgame, which I'm terrified mm. and really looking forward to. And I think it will make me a better director of new work um, to just have to be the, you know, we're not, people say we're not authors, even though we write our productions. And so I think it will be a good, I'm afraid to do it. So I know it will be good. Fear is great. Yes. <laughs> um, I was actually, I was in London when everything shut down and London shut down a week later. Yes, me too. <laughs> right, were it's you? It's like, ABA shut down, you guys. This isn't going to happen. Exactly. They're like, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> I know. And they, you know, they, they keep calm, carry on. You know the Brits. It was yes. just that. And so I was doing a show at the Young Vic, which was a house music opera. And it was all house music sung by opera singers. So when you said the, the idea of opera, um, and it, which we now are figuring out timing-wise when we're going to make that happen again. But that was in the middle of, of, you know, having to stop like that was devastating. And um, in the 
in the time frame of projects, there's a project I've been working on for 10 years that's, that will start shooting next year, which is a movie about a young black ice skater and in Brooklyn and uh, called Take the Ice. Um, Brian Boitano is an old friend of mine who is a gold medalist skater. And I said to him one day, why aren't there black ice skaters? There was Debbie Thomas decades ago. And I said, and, and I answered it by saying, because there are no images. And I thought, I want to create something where young women of color and men of color get to see themselves skating, because you don't ever see that. And you will do something if you see yourself doing it. If you say, oh, I could be this skater. Oh, I can do this thing. And so this is a movie. I had it at Disney. We all know. We both know what that is. It was at Disney for years. And then my executive from Disney went to Netflix and said, I'm making a movie called and this is happening. And we start we start shooting next year. And uh, it's uh, but to be able to do work like this, that that people that you don't see people that are never recognized to be able to put them out front and not apologize just to put them there that that's what's so thrilling and then and like you Aaron I'm in between all my television work but these are like you know a project that took 10 years a project that took 15 years and they're happening at the same time it's 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 so funny because the announcements of both came out on the same day and I just thought okay I don't know what this means but at least I'm I'm not in the senior citizen home yet. Close, but at least I'll I'm, you know I'll oh, get you're it done. Very good gardener, you planted seeds, you tended your seeds, you fed them, and look now. Okay, <laughs> whatever you say, Danya. Whatever. You say. That's good. It's no, good. It's great. It's that, and it's the story we all talk about. You know that I'm I'm able to do it. I just but I kept I had to do it right. You know, and that was that's the point. Well, you guys are so uh kind and so interesting and i'm so happy to have met you both and i know everyone here tonight is grateful for our conversation and uh for a bunch of dookies watching this show y'all are lame with the questions there were just like no questions so next time at the next demon live event fire away some more questions but i am um so happy to be able to step in tonight and and talk with everybody. Before we let you all go, there are an exciting announcement. We have some lucky winners of tickets to a Broadway Plus virtual workshop. And the lucky Blue Devils are Austin Powers from uh, class of 2015 with the best name of any class <laughs> exactly. ever. Hope Lou, uh, class of 09. Justine Shy or She, forgive me if I'm saying that wrong, class of 26. I'm doing that math. Hi, Justine. Welcome to Duke. And Mariah Matthias, or Matthias, class of 25, another young Blue Devil. Congratulations. You guys get to go to a Broadway Plus virtual workshop, which is very cool. I am one of, uh, of the Broadway Plus teachers and artists, and so maybe you'll see me there. Um, and uh, Demon will email you to coordinate your prizes. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Charles Randolph Wright. Thank you, Donnie Seymour. Um, I, thank, I you, Demon. Everyone... thank you, Demon, for what you're thank doing. Thank you, Demon. Yes, and, we want to thank you. Make, making us do these things. I think it's, it's I, I love that, you know. Amy, there we go. <laughs> yes, Amy, thank you. And, and all on the Duke team for making this happen, Erica and Nina and everyone. Um, and you can stream tonight's conversation along with 50 plus episodes of uh, Demon Live at DukeDemon.com. Until we meet again, uh, everyone, please go see Trouble in Mind and go see Passover. I wish I was in New York. And if I get there, I am going to uh, beg our panelists this evening for house seat access, please. Um, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have just said that because now you're about to get 70 emails from people begging you for seats. I, I just ruined that and you can forward all of that, all, all of that to me. I owe you that now. Um, and, uh, and thank you everyone. Go, go get the Broadway Lullabies album too. Yes, I, I, we have to get that album. Please do. Thanks all. <laughs>